Welcome back to another episode of Give Me Some Truth. Uh, I'm here in the office with Clint and Sill, and we are talking about a pretty timely topic uh, that, that's um, not something that we normally do. We don't chase headlines normally when it comes to the podcast and, and, uh, and recording information, but this felt like the, the, uh, the event to do that. We've been getting questions from clients uh, as we sit here in the third week of May, um, counting down here to June 1st in the debt ceiling debate, and that's the, the topic of the, the uh, podcast today. Um, and I think we, we talked earlier before the uh, record button was uh, was pressed um, of did we want to discuss if it's going to pass, will it, won't it, that kind of thing, or did we want to kind of go with the assumption that the three of us have, which is that it will get done and then have more of a discussion around kind of the impact of that and then um, maybe the after effect of it. So uh, I think first and foremost, we all agree that a deal is going to get done, but I think we're of the mindset that um, – you know, 11 p.m. on the 31st of May would not surprise any of the three of us if that's when the deal actually gets done. Um, Clint, why, speak for the group, why do you think that's the case? Well, I mean, it's brinksmanship. And I think that we go through, you know, you're kind of, each side wants to extract out of the other side as much as they possibly can. It's a, it's a pretty normal negotiation. It's just that um, we haven't seen, a lot of these go up to the 11th hour, and that's because we're in the political environment that we're in. Uh, I mean, McCarthy's getting in a room with Biden directly, and they're trying to hammer out uh, a deal. You know, it looks like some concessions are being made. If you look at Twitter, um, you know, we'll see what happens over the coming days. But, um, yeah, I think they're going through the whole cycle that the market goes through. You know, you go through euphoria that a deal is going to get done and the market rallies a little bit. And then you go through the despair of things are starting to fall apart and no deal is ever going to get done. And there's no chance this thing is going to work out and we're going to see our, our first right. big, you know, default. And so there's this brinksmanship. And I think this is a normal path as messy as it is. This is how politics happen and this is how deals get made. And, and eventually we'll see cooler heads prevail because I don't think either side either want wants to see any sort of catastrophic default. So uh, there's some horse trading going on right now. Yeah, exactly. And it's not the first time, right? right. We need to remember that this isn't the first, yeah. you know, dead ceiling debate that we've had. We could go back to 2013 and it would have been Boehner and Obama as opposed to McCarthy and Biden, but the same type of negotiations were going on and they ended up getting a deal done. So I expect that the same thing will happen this time around. I think it's pretty fair to say in, in, we could see some choppy markets between now and then, right? As the headlines kind of kind of come out almost on an hourly basis of kind of what's going on. And Clint's point's a good one. Now that we live in the world of, of Twitter and and up to the second uh, updates, uh, you know, it, there could be a little could a little whipsaw going back and forth in the markets. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the market hates uncertainty, right? And this is the height of uncertainty when you have the United States having you know, risking potential technical default, right? Um, but so that's also the goal for everyone around the negotiation table is avoiding that credit event, right? Avoiding that scenario where the United States cannot make a coupon payment on a treasury. Right. That would be the nightmare scenario. Yeah, you think about the, the two guys that are in there negotiating right now or the groups of people that are negotiating. They want you to believe that they are just crazy enough mm -hmm. to default if you you're willing to go over that and to go over that sort of bridge and you have to have the other person believe that and as long as that other person does believe it then you have the negotiating power so you know i think that's what we're going to see is you're going to see all this coming in and oh man it's going to be a spectacle but i do think it gets done as messy as it as it is right right absolutely and I, I also think that, um, you know, you see some things and the things to watch, the stock market's been actually going up in the thought that this thing is going to get done. And I'd be interested to hear your comments on that. Still, I think that perhaps, you know, we haven't seen the, the downdraft that, that could occur, you know, when things kind of break down here. And I do expect them to break down for a little bit. Um, and you could see a bad market day. But I think the bond market is the, the thing to watch. Um, that's almost more fun to watch, I believe, because, you know, we're seeing treasury yields, um, rally a bit, 
uh, particularly on T bales, really short term right. uh, stuff is starting to rally, uh, and so those yields are going up. And then also a little rally in corporate bonds, which I I think is interesting as well. Yeah, I mean it's it's been a risk on market since the beginning of the year, um, and inter- interestingly, it's tech stocks that are leading the rally, right? So this is almost a return to the the sort of you know QE era. Uh, of liquidity driven uh, markets where, you know, the the growth oriented tech sector is leading the market. And I think that's really interesting. The bond market, if you look at the short end, if you look at treasury bills, that's kind of live odds on a deal getting done, right? So that tells you to the minute if yields are going down, it's more likely that a deal is getting done. What's interesting as well is if you look at longer dated US treasuries, it's clear that the market is not worried about U.S. solvency in the long term, right? So what that tells you is that as bad as negotiations could get, um, the market doesn't think it has a long-term impact on the credit worthiness of the United States, right? So it's a very short-term technical issue that you know, we're trying to work through. Long-term treasuries. I mean, I, I think they're kind of hilarious right now because the long-term treasury people are the, the long-term investor that does not care about anything. They're like, yeah, interest rates, they're not really going up. <laughs> it's fine. This is short-term inflation, you know, whatever. Everything's going to go back down. And they don't believe that we're insolvent at all. We're totally fine. We could pay our bills. Just chill out. We're not going to give you that much of a yield on that stuff yet. <laughs> It's, it's just hilarious. I agree. I mean, long-term treasuries look through all the noise and the short-term drama, and they tell you, oh, look, 10 years, 3.5%. Yeah, I'll take that, you know. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it sends a, a kind of mixed but reasonably constructive message overall, I think. So you're saying, like, treasury bills are like when you tell your wife, just just relax or calm down, <laughs> and it just freaks out, you know, and you're like, that's not really the thing you need to do. You need to act like a long-term treasury bond. Just kind of chill out. Just it's fine. How does it work out when you generally? It, d- it doesn't go well. <laughs> I got to tell you that much. It does not go well. You, you could, I, not yeah. well at there's all. There's no way. If there's things that you learn. Give it a shot. After, you know, being married. Yep. For as long as I have. And you never tell anyone to calm down. You never tell anyone to stop yeah. overreacting. <laughs> That's just, not a good idea. You can't. You no. just, you, you just got to let it go. Act like a long-term treasury. Mm-hmm. I, it's funny, but it's like long-term treasury is like, it's, it's the just absolute inverse of like the media too. Right. I mean, the, the, the media is just so like. You know, just react, 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 and long-term treasury, it's it, like you said, kind of just sees through that noise. Yeah, and there's a lot of noise right now, and um, I think it's ultimately going to get solved. We'll be fine. Um, you know, I, I do want to talk a little bit about with you, Sil, about tech stocks. I mean, why have tech stocks just done so well now with interest rates still being high, in your view, and what would, ha- what would have to happen for that rally to kind of just fizzle out here and go the other way? Sure. Well, I think interest rates are still high, but they've come down a bit. And I think that's the key. So more than the absolute level of interest rates, uh, the market is concerned with the general direction of interest rates. And so there's two components. There's interest rates and there there's liquidity in in. Uh, as you can think about it, like the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet and the size of the monetary base overall. So uh, those factors have a huge impact on the tech sector. And we've seen that pretty much in the entire, what I like to call the QE era, basically the 2010 to you know 2021, more or less, um, tech-driven market rally with ever-expanding valuations in the tech world driving the market. So you're seeing a little bit of a a return to those market dynamics. And it's driven, I think, by slightly lower interest rates. Um, Hints from the Federal Reserve that they're going to change course and pause interest rate increases. And also uh, an uptick in the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, which I like to use as a proxy for the, the monetary base overall. And uh, interestingly, a lot of that has to do with the banking crisis, right? When the Federal Reserve started making um, liquidity um, 
facilities available to regional banks, the size of its balance sheet started to increase, liquidity conditions started to improve in markets, and that had an immediate impact on you know, the market overall and sector dynamics within the, the, the equity market. So I thought that was really interesting. And it's also an example of this kind of bad news being good news, kind of crazy type of market dynamics that we've gotten used to in the last few years, where things that are bad end up being positive for markets because the secondary effect of those bad things happening is that monetary policy gets looser and that ends up being a positive for markets. So um, I think it's a little bit of what we're seeing now on a very, very small short-term scale. Yeah, like that jobs report, we don't want it to get be a You don't want it to be too good because then the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rate, right? So you need it to be just right. You know, good enough that it's not a, a recession, but, you know, just bad enough. So far, it's been fine. But, you know, it's been we'll, fine. we'll see if that persists. And then the secondary uh, part of that is every time the Fed seems like they're going to start reducing the size of their balance sheet, something happens. Something happens. And they got to right. step right in and they just fill right back up. Right. And that's going to continue until we find a better way to solve problems than, you know, have the Federal Reserve write a big check. Right? Well, that, I wanted to get into that, too, because, uh, you know, I was just reading this morning that, you know, when the deal gets done, right? mm-hmm. big assumption, when the deal gets done, the, the Fed's going to sell something to the tune of like 500 to $700 billion of treasury notes to fill their coffers back up. And then yeah. what effect does that have, you know, on the markets as well? Uh, one bank, Bank of America, maybe, I think, came out and said that will be the equivalent of like a quarter of an interest rate hike by the Fed is is just them doing what they're going to need to do once the yeah. deal gets done to basically fill the accounts back up. Yeah. I think part of that is already priced in. I sure. think a lot of people, market participants, investors yeah. expect that to happen. But yeah, on a very practical level, what's happening at the U.S. Treasury is that their account is running out of money. Yeah. Uh, and the way that they put more money in the account is by issuing debt, but they need to have the legal standing to do that. And the mechanism to do that is increasing the debt ceiling. So the minute, the the instant that the deal gets done, they're going to go out to the market and issue a bunch of debt. Interest rates are probably going to go up a little bit, but part of that is already, is already priced in. So, but yes, that's the first thing we're going to see happen when the deal happens is, a bunch of debt is going to get issued. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe a good analogy would be if you were going to do some work on your home, right? And you 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 went to apply for a home equity line of credit, mm-hmm. right? That's where they're at right now, trying to get approved, that's, if you will, right? That's and then much once it. they get approved, right. then they're going to go spend the money. And that's essentially what the federal government's doing. They can't spend mm-hmm. the money until they get approved is basically where they're at. Correct. Right. Their paperwork's a little, little snappy. They work slow, the like right they now. need to provide mm-hmm. some more information. The yeah. underwriters are slow. Yeah. Right. They need three right. years of tax returns right. and, <laughs> and uh, six of their pay stubs and right. everything that we're accustomed mm-hmm. to. Born child. Loans. That's right. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. The Fed meets the 13th and the 14th. What, uh, what impact do we think that has on just the, uh, the world in general? Yeah. So, I mean, by now, by then, hopefully it'll be resolved. That being said, like that 1st of June deadline is it's just a date that you know the Department of Treasury came out with that uh, Janet Yellen kind of came up with. Um, there may be some flexibility there, so it doesn't necessarily mean that on June first the U.S. will default. Um, there may be a little bit of leeway um, for you know Treasuries, the Department of Treasury, to continue paying its bills. Um, but if we get to the middle of June, I think I think things are going to start getting really, really complicated. Um, what's interesting there and the way that that is relevant to the interest rate discussion is, you know, the Federal Reserve, they are politically independent, supposedly, right, in their, in their uh, interest rate policy. But, you know, they need to take into account the fact that yeah, they need to take into account what goes on in the economy as a whole, right? And anything that is negative, I think, gives them a reason 
to change course, right? So it gives them an excuse, so to speak, to kind of come out and say, look, given the uncertainty in the banking sector and given the uncertainty with the debt ceiling negotiation, we think that it's time to maybe soften our, our, our stance a little bit and, uh, and and slow the pace of interest rate increases or, or 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 pause, right? And so I think it's just yet another reason for um, the Federal Reserve to continue to give that very kind of market friendly guidance that people are hoping for, where they would start talking more explicitly about not increasing interest rates anymore, right? And so in a weird way, um, I think that could almost be a positive for markets because we know what the market loves is low interest rates, increased liquidity. And I think if, if Powell gets more excuses or more ammunitions to uh, you know, have reasons to do that, uh, I think that could turn out to be a positive. Yeah, I think they're waiting to just, um, you know, I, I know that people are waiting to hear, oh, we're going to start cutting rates. I think we're a little premature there. I think something catastrophic would have to happen for us to even talk about right. cutting rates seriously. I do believe that they want to have a nice excuse to pause and just kind of almost see what's going on. I mean, if you think about it, we've we've gone on a really big run. It's been a pretty quick run of the rise in interest rates. And if you look at all of that and what we've seen in the past, um, you know, this is not unprecedented, but it's not super precedented either. Um, it, it's been a rapid increase. Things have changed significantly. We've had some bank failures. There's some definitely definite cracks in there, and they're trying to hold it all together. And, you know, I believe that kind of waiting and seeing might not be a bad course of action here. Let's just take a look at where we stand and let it play out a little bit rather than twiddling the knobs all the time and trying to do something. Right. And yeah, I know absolutely. that they're trying to, you know, they got to keep inflation. Inflation is, and, and for people that are listening here, let's be clear about this. Inflation is too high right now. There is no question sure. about that. And not by a little bit. That's exactly right. And so I think people are unprepared for right. um, the pain that still might be yeah. uh, I, that we might have to recognize. Absolutely. And you had asked me earlier, you know, about markets doing well since the beginning of the year and right. what could possibly change that. One of the signals that I'm looking for is um, maybe the Federal Reserve changing course and, and tightening again and entering this type of quantitative tightening 2.0 type of phase where, okay, they pause for a little bit. And then before you know it, everybody gets bullish again. The debt ceiling gets resolved. Uh, corporate earnings continue to be fairly strong. Job numbers continue to be fairly strong. And before you know it, you get a couple of hot to, you know, higher than expected inflation numbers. Yep. And that's all it takes for the Federal Reserve to come out again and, and start tightening. And I don't think it would take a whole lot for them to do that. And, and I think at that point, like we saw in 2022, the way the market reacted to, you know, a very clear, aggressive uh, uh, policy of, of increasing interest rates and tightening on the part of the Federal Reserve. I think if they were to shift to that next gear, that is a real risk, and that's something that could change this bullish you know, market dynamics um, pretty significantly. Going full Volcker? Going full Volcker. Uh, yeah, I think it's, I mean, at the end of the day, we all, maybe we don't, maybe I shouldn't say it that way. At the end of the day, the Fed has made it relatively clear that their job is not to keep the market propped up. <laughs> their job is to fight inflation, mm -hmm. and if that is, is at the expense of, you know, the, yeah. the, the market's gains, well, that's how that goes. I think and, that that's and, been pretty, pretty and to well your point, seen, inflation yeah. is still too high. What we're seeing now is not, is, you know, disinflation. It's not deflation. So prices are not going down. They're just increasing at a slower pace, right? So we've gone from an 8% increase to a 5% increase, uh, which is still bad, right? And, you know, officially the Fed has a pretty loose target around 2%. So we're not quite there yet. And so, you know, I think there's a real risk that um, as we go into the later part of the year and a lot of the noise and uncertainty that we are grappling with right now kind of goes away that, you know, they could turn around and start, you know, looking at 
tightening policy again. And I think that's a risk. That's a, I think that's a big risk. And I think that's a risk that might not be priced in at this point. I mean, no, I agree. You know, we've seen a pretty nice run up in the market this year. I mean, not a bad year so far. It's kind of claw. I always say it's kind of climbing that wall of worry, yeah. which is nice because it hasn't been a lot of, you know, big all in days. It's been kind mm-hmm. of a nice, steady, slow plodding along sort of recovery this year. It yeah. seems like a couple fits and starts, but um, you know, overall it's been a pretty nice year. I, I think if the market ended this year, we would all high five and say nice job, but I don't, we got a long way to go oh, yeah. this far. So thus far. So I, I think that, uh, you know, that story is going to be written the rest of the year and we'll see what happens with the fed. Um, I expect, I don't know what you think, but I expect them to pause and just kind of take a look and see what happens. So we'll see. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, um, thanks for joining us today. I think that that gives us a good, uh, representation of what's happening here. We'll return with some future podcasts, maybe a postmortem of that. Maybe we'll be all criticizing ourselves for not taking any of this, well, you're taking it seriously, but I would just say maybe we're all going to have a totally different scenario to talk about. Hopefully not. Um, and then after, maybe we can talk about how we see uh, the year ahead of us and what might be some risks and what might be some surprising upsides. So thanks for joining us on another episode of Give Me Some Truth. Walkner Cotton Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor with the SEC. Registration with the SEC does not imply a certain level of skill or training. The opinions expressed by the participants of this podcast are their own and do not reflect the opinions of Walkner Cotton Financial Advisors. All statements and opinions expressed are based upon information considered reliable, although it should not be relied upon as such. Any statements or opinions are subject to change without notice. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Information expressed does not take into account your specific situation or objectives and is not intended as recommendations appropriate for any individual. Listeners are encouraged to seek advice from a qualified tax, legal, or investment advisor to determine whether any information presented may be suitable for their specific situation. Past performance is not indicative of future performance. Thanks for listening, and for further information, please visit walknercondon.com.